We're going to be finishing up with chapter 10. This is the final part, part E. If you haven't viewed the previous lectures, please be sure to do so. You can find them in the links below. In addition to that, they're also in the playlist if you go to the main channel. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. Send me a message through Facebook, YouTube, or you can leave them in the comments below. But if you email to me, I get them right away and I, I'll usually reply back to you. I've had some instances uh, this past week where I've got uh, some messages on the people posted in the comments area and for whatever reason I wasn't able to reply back to them uh, so please be sure and and s send me an email out um, and I'll get back to you right away so let's move forward so we'll start off with muscles that are crossing the hip and knee joints and these are responsible for movements at the thigh and the leg the muscles of the thigh are difficult to segregate into groups on the basis of actions so what we did instead is we grouped them according to their position so it's either anterior medial or posterior. Some thigh muscles act only at the hip joints, others only at the knee, while still others they act on both joints. Most anterior muscles of the hip and thigh, they flex the femur at the hip and extend the legs at the knee, and this produces the forcing of your leg when we're walking. The posterior muscles of the hip and thigh, they mostly extend the thigh and flex the legs, so this is what gives the, the backswing of, of your leg when we're walking. A third group of muscles in the region, the medial or the adductor muscles, these all adduct the thigh and they have no effect on the leg at all. In the thigh, the anterior, posterior and adductor muscles are separated by walls of fascia and this is how we get the anterior, posterior and medial compartments. The fascia lata, which is the deep fascia of the thigh, it surrounds and includes all three groups of muscles like a support stocking. Movements of the thigh that occur at the hip joints, they're accomplished largely by muscles that are anchored to the pelvic girdle. Like the shoulder joint, the hip joint is a ball and socket joint that allows for flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, and rotation. Muscles that affect these movements of the thigh, they're among the most powerful muscles of your body. For the most part, the thigh flexors pass in front of the hip joint. The most important of these muscles are the iliopsa, the tensor fascia latae, and the rectus femoris. And they're assisted in this action by the adductor muscles of the medial thigh and the strap-like sartorius muscle. The iliopsis is actually made up of two muscles. It's made up of the iliacus and the psoas major, and this is the prime mover of thigh flexion. Thigh extension is affected primarily by the hamstring muscle of the posterior thigh, and during forceful extension, the gluteus maximus of your butt is activated. Now the butt muscles that lie lateral to the hip joint, which are the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus, they abduct the thigh. Remember, abduct, abduct. The opposite of that thigh adduction is the role of the adductor muscles of the medial thigh. Abduction, abduction, and adduction of the thighs, they're extremely important during walking to shift the trunk from side to side so that the body's weight is balanced over the limb that's on the ground. So let's look at the anterior and medial muscles that promote movement of your thigh and leg. So the first one we're going to be looking at is this iliopsis muscle. And as I mentioned earlier, this is made up of two muscles, the iliacus and the psoas majors. And they're fibers that pass under the inguinal ligament and then they insert by a common tender on the femur. The iliacus is the more lateral muscle and it's a large fan-shaped muscle. Its origin is the iliac fossa and crest and the ala of the sacrum. Its insertion is the lesser trochanter of the femur by the iliososis tendon. As for his action, the iliososis is the prime mover for flexing the thigh or for flexing the trunk on the thigh, as in when we were bowing. And it's innervated by the femoral nerve, L2 and L3. The psoas major, this is what the butchers call the tenderloin. This is the longer, the thicker, the more medial muscle of the two. Its origin is by a fleshy slip from the transverse process and the bodies and the discs of the lumbar vertebrae and T12. Its insertion is the lesser trochanter of the femur by the iliososis tendon. As for its actions, it's going to be identical to that as we spoke of for the iliacus. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, it also affects the lateral flexion of the vertebral column. And this is also an important postural muscle. For its nervous supply, it's innervated by the ventral rami. The sartorius is a strap-like superficial muscle that's running obliquely across the anterior surface of the thigh to the knee. This is the longest muscle in the body and it crosses both hip and knee joints. Its origin is the anterior superior iliac spine, and for the insertion, it winds around the medial aspect of the knee and it inserts into the medial aspect of the proximal tibia. Its prime actions are flexing, abducting, and laterally rotating the thigh, and flexing the knee. It's often called the tailor's muscle because it produces this cross-legged position that you see tailors doing. And we have an animation here for the iliososis muscle, so be sure to look at this. And here's another one for the sartorius muscle. Uh, so be sure you view both of these uh, animations either on the Pearson website or you can uh, look for it on YouTube in addition to that if your book came with the DVD. Again, I stress this to you guys over and over again because a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but a handful of the questions 
that uh, could be on exams will come from these animations. So be sure you look at this. And also it helps reinforce what you learned. Now we're going to be looking at the muscles of the medial compartment of the thigh. And the adductors, these are the large muscle mass that consists of three muscles, the adductor magnus, adductor longus, and the adductor brevis. And they form the medial aspect of the thigh. They rise in the inferior part of the pelvis and they insert at various levels on the femur. They're all used in movements that press the thighs together as when we stride a horse and they're important in pelvic tilting movements that occur during walking and in fixing the hip when the knee is flexed and the foot is off the ground. The entire group is innervated by the obturator nerve and strains or stretching of this group is what we call a pulled groin. And when we strain or stretch this muscle group, we call this a pulled groin. This first muscle we're going to be looking at, this adductor magnus. This is a triangular muscle with a broad insertion. Uh, it's a composite muscle that's part adductor and part hamstring in action. Its origin is the ischial and pubic rami and the ischial tuberosity. And the insertion is the adductor tubercle of the femur. For its actions, the anterior part adducts and medially rotates and flexes the thigh. And the posterior part is a synergist of the hamstring and thigh extension. And it's innervated by the obturator nerve as well as the sciatic nerve. The adductor longus, this overlies the middle aspect of the adductor magnus and is the most anterior of the adductor muscles. Its action is to adduct, flex, and medially rotate the thigh, and it's also innervated by the obturator nerve. The adductor brevis muscle is in contact with the obturator externus muscle. It's largely concealed by the adductor longus and the pectineus. Its origin is the body and inferior ramus of the pubis, and its insertion is the linea aspera above the adductor longus. For its actions, it adducts and medially rotates the thigh, and it's also innervated by the obturator nerve. The pectineus is a short, flat muscle that overlies the adductor brevis on the proximal thigh. It also abuts the adductor longus medially. Its origin is the pubis and the superior ramus, and the insertion is from the lesser trochanter inferior to the linea aspera on the posterior aspect of the femur. Its action is to adduct, flex, and medially rotate the thigh, and is innervated by the femoral nerve and sometimes the obturator nerve. The gracilis is the long, thin, superficial muscle of the medial thigh. Its origin is the inferior ramus and the body of the pubis and the adjacent ischial ramus. Its insertion is the medial surface of the tibia, just inferior to its medial condyle. Its actions are to adduct the thighs and to flex and medially rotate the legs, especially during walking. And it's innervated by the obturator nerve. At the knee joint, flexion and extension are the main movements. The sole knee extensor is the quadriceps femoris muscle of the anterior thigh. This is the most powerful muscle we have in our body. The quadriceps is antagonized by the hamstrings of the posterior compartment, which are the prime movers of knee flexion. The quadriceps, they arise from four separate heads that form the flesh of the front and side of the thighs. These heads have a common insertion tendon, which is a quadriceps tendon that inserts into the patella and then via the patellar ligament into the tibial tuberosity. The quadriceps are innervated by the femoral nerve and the tone of the quadriceps plays an important role in strengthening the knee joint. Now the first of the quadriceps femoris muscle that we're going to be looking at is the rectus femoris. And this is a superficial muscle of the anterior thigh. It runs straight down the thigh, has the longest head and the only muscle of the group to cross the hip joint. Its origin is the anterior inferior iliac spine and the superior margin of the acetabulum. The insertion is the patella and the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. Its prime action is to extend the knee and flex the thigh at the hips and it's innervated by the femoral nerve. Next, we have the vastus lateralis. This is the largest head of the group. It forms the lateral aspect of the thigh and it's a common intramuscular injection site. Its origin is the greater trochanter, the intertrochantic line, and the linea aspera. Its insertion is the same as the rectus femoris, which is the patella and the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. Its action is to extend and stabilize the knee and it's also innervated by the femoral nerve. The vastus medialis forms the inframedial aspect of the thigh. Its origin is the linea aspera, the intertrochantric, and the medial supracondral lines. Its insertion is also the patella and the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. And its prime action is to extend the knee, and it's also innervated by the femoral nerve. The vastus intermedius lies deep to the rectus femoris. It lies between the vastus lateralis and the vastus medialis on the anterior thigh. Its origin is the anterior and lateral surface of the proximal femur shaft. Its insertion is also the same as the rectus femoris, so it's the patella and the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligament. Its action is to extend the knee and is also innervated by the femoral nerve. The tensor fascia lata is enclosed between the fascia layers of the anterolateral aspect of the thigh. It's functionally associated with the medial rotators and flexors of the thigh. Its origin is the anterior aspect of the iliac crest and the anterior superior iliac spine. And its insertion is the iliotibial tract. 
Its main action is to steady the knee and the trunk on the thigh by making the iliotibial tract taut. So it flexes and adducts the thigh as well, and it rotates the thigh medially. And it's innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. So be sure to watch the videos. Here's one for the rectus femoris. This is for the vastus lateralis. This is uh, goes to show the vastus medialis. And this goes to show the vastus intermedius. And there's one more for the tensor fascia latte. So please be sure you view these. Again, you can go to the Pearson website, uh, look for them on YouTube, or then again, uh, if your book came with the DVD, be sure to look at that disc. We're going to be moving on with the posterior muscles. And all these muscles over here, they're abductors. But in addition to that, they're also lateral rotators. So when you look at the gluteus maximus, it will rotate the thigh laterally. The gluteus medius will rotate the thighs medially. The gluteus minimus will rotate the thigh medially. Uh, the piriformis, it also rotates the thigh laterally. The obturator externus will rotate the thigh laterally. And the obturator internus will rotate the thigh laterally. As well as the, the gemellus, which will also rotate the thigh laterally. So be sure you view this animation here. This is going to show you posterior muscles that cross the hip joint. The gluteus maximus is the largest and most superficial of the gluteus muscles. It forms the bulk of the butt mass and the fibers are thick and coarse. And it's an important site for intramuscular injections. It overlies the sciatic nerve and it covers the ischial tuberosity when we're standing. When we're sitting, it moves superiorly, leaving the ischial tuberosity exposed in the subcutaneous position. The origin is the dorsal ilium, sacrum, and the coccyx. The insertion is the gluteal tuberosity of the femur and the iliotibial tract. As for its action, this is a major extensor of the thigh. This is a very powerful muscle and it's most effective when the thigh is flexed and force is necessary, as in when you're rising from a forward and flexed position. Additionally, in thrusting the thighs posteriorly as when we're climbing the stairs and running. It also laterally rotates and abducts the thigh. For its nerve supply, it's innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve. The gluteus medius, this is a thick muscle that's largely covered by the gluteus maximus. It's an important site for injections also, for intramuscular injections, just as we saw in the gluteus maximus. Uh, the gluteus medius, this site is the ventral gluteal site for the injections, whereas in the gluteus maximus, it was the dorsal gluteal site. This ventral gluteal site is considered to be safer because you're farther away from the sciatic nerve. Its origin is between the anterior and posterior gluteal lines on the lateral surface of the ilium, and its insertion is by a short tendon into the lateral aspect of the greater trochanter of the femur. Its prime action is to abduct and medially rotate the thighs. It steadies the pelvis and its actions are very important in walking and is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. The gluteus minimus this is the smallest and the deepest of the gluteal muscles. Its origin is between the anterior and inferior gluteal lines on the external surface of the ilium. Its insertion is the anterior border of the greater trochanter of the femur. Its action is the same as for the gluteus maximus as well as for its nervous supply, which is the superior gluteal nerve. And in this picture of the cadaver, you can see the gluteus medius over here and there. And here's your gluteus maximus. And this is the median sacral crust. In uh, addition to that, we can see, um, let's see, we talked about this muscle here, the gracilis. You can see that. And um, I think that's just about it for this point. So be sure you view the animation. This is going to show you the animation for the posterior view of the gluteus maximus. And this is going to show you the lateral view of the gluteus medius. Uh, again, be sure to go to the Pearson website. The, you can search uh, YouTube. In addition to that, you can always refer to the disc that came with your book. Now we move on to the lateral rotators. So the first one I'm going to look at is this muscle right over here. This is called uh, the piriformis. And this is a pyramidal muscle that's located on the posterior aspect of the hip joint. It's inferior to the gluteus minimus, and it issues from the pelvis via the greater sciatic notch. Its origins the anterolateral lateral surface of the sacrum opposite the greater sciatic notch, and its insertion is the superior border of the greater trochanter of the femur. Its actions rotate and extend the thighs laterally. Because it's inserted above the head of the femur, it can also assist in abduction of the thigh when the hip is flexed, and it helps stabilize the hip joint. And it's innervated by the first and second sacral nerves and the fifth lumbar nerve. Next, we look at the obturator internus. It surrounds the obturator foramen within the pelvis, and it leaves the pelvis via the lesser sciatic notch, and it turns acutely forward to insert into the femur. Its origin is the inner surface of the obturator membrane, the greater sciatic notch, and the margins of the obturator foramen. Its insertion is the greater trochanter in front of the piriformis. Its action is the same as the piriformis, and is innervated by the L5 and S1 nerves. 
Next, we have the obturator externus. This is a flat triangular muscle that's deep in the supramedial aspect of the thigh. Its origin is the outer surface of the obturator membrane, the pubis initium, and the margins of the obturator foramen. Its insertion is by a tendon into the trochantic fossa of the posterior femur. Its actions are the same as the piriformis and is innervated by the obturator nerve. The next muscle is the gemellus, and the gemellus is actually two small muscles with a common insertion and actions. They're considered extra pelvic portions of the obturator and internus. The origin for the superior gemellus is the ischial spine, and the origin for the inferior gemellus is the ischial tuberosity. Their insertion is the greater trochanter of the femur. Their action is the same as for the piriformis, and they're innervated by the lumbar fifth and the first sacral nerves. The quadratus femoris is a short, thick muscle. It's the most inferior of the lateral rotator muscles, and it extends laterally from the pelvis. Its origin is the ischial tuberosity, and the insertion is the intertrochantic crest of the femur. Its action is to rotate the thighs laterally, and it stabilizes the hip joint. Its nerve supply comes from L5 and S1. The hamstrings are fleshy muscles of the posterior thigh. They consist of the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. They cross both the hip and knee joints and are prime movers of thigh extension and knee flexion. The hamstrings have a common organ side and they're innervated by two nerves that branch off the sciatic nerve, which are the tibial and common fibular nerves which are wrapped in a common sheath. Pulled hamstrings are common sports injuries that we see in athletes who have to run very hard. So we tend to see this in football players who are halfbacks. So in this illustration we can see the hamstring muscles and we can see the biceps femoris. They consist of a long head and a short head. Then we have the semitendinosus. And finally, we have the semimembranosus. The biceps femoris muscle, this is the lateral most muscle of the group. And it arises from two heads. You have a long head, and then we have a short head. The origin for the long head is the ischial tuberosity. And the origin for the short head are the linea aspera, the lateral supracondylar line, and the distal femur. Its insertion is by a common tendon that passes downwards and laterally that forms the lateral border of the popliteal fossa. And it inserts into the head of the fibula and lateral condyle of the tibia. Its prime action is to extend the thighs and flex the knees. It also laterally rotates the legs when the knees are flexed. It's innervated by the tibial nerve that goes to the long head and the common fibular nerve to the short head. The semitendinosus lies medial to the biceps femoris. Its origin is the ischial tuberosity and common with the long head of the biceps femoris. Its insertion is the medial aspect of the upper tibial shaft. Its prime action is to extend the thighs and flex the knees. Along with the semimembranosus, it immediately rotates the leg and it's innervated by the tibial nerve. The semimembranosus lies deep to the semitendinosus. Its origin is the ischial tuberosity, and the insertion is the medial condyle of the tibia, and via the oblique popliteal ligament to the lateral condyle of the femur. Its prime action is to extend the thighs and flex the knees. It also immediately rotates the leg, and it's innervated by the tibial nerve. And this uh, photograph of the cadaver, you can see the uh, semitendinosus here, the semimembranosus here, and the biceps femoris over here. So be sure you view the animation. Um, we have the, this one shows the biceps femoris. This one goes over the semitendinosus. The next one goes over the semimembranosus. And then this video shows uh, an overview of the muscles that act on the hip joint and femur. And this shows movements at the hip joint. This one shows you the anterior muscles that cross the hip joint, muscles that cross the knee joint, the posterior flexors that act on the knee, and finally movements at the knee joint. So be sure you view all those uh, animations either at the Pearson website, on uh, searching for it on YouTube, or referring to the DVD that may have come with your book. Uh, again, I can't stress you enough to look at these videos. A lot of the questions on the exams, they probably, in one form or another, will be will come from these animations. So be sure to view these. Now we're going to be moving on with the movements of the ankle and toes. The deep fascia of the leg is continuous with the fascia lata that ensheets the thigh. Like a snug knee sock underneath the skin, the leg fascia binds the leg muscles tightly, helping to prevent excessive swelling of the muscles during exercise and also in aiding venous return. Its inward extension segregates the leg muscles into anterior, lateral, and posterior compartments, each with its own nerve and blood supply. Distally, the leg fascia thicken to form the flexor, extensor, and fibular retinicula, which are referred to as the ankle brackets that hold the tendons in place where they run to the foot. The fibular retinicula is also sometimes referred to as a perineal retinicula. The various muscles of the leg, they promote movements at the ankle joint where we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. At the intertarsal joint, we have 
inversion and eversion of the foot. And at the toes, we have flexion and extension. In case you forgot the terminology, plantar flexion is when, so when you're driving a car and you're stomp on the, on the gas, that's plantar, uh, plantar flexion. And then when you take your foot off the gas, that's dorsiflexion. For inversion and eversion, think of inversion when you're taking your toes and you're pointing it, uh, you're pointing your toe towards your other leg, the, the foot of your other leg. That's going to be inversion. Okay, you're pointing it medially. And eversion is where you're taking your, again, your toe and you're trying to point it the opposite way. You're trying to point it laterally. Then we have flexion and extension of the toes. So remember, flexion is when you curl your toes up and extend is when you, 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 you know, you recoil your toes. You, you let them relax and they start to stick back out or they start to point upwards uh, towards the ceiling. That's going to be uh, extension. So flexion of the toes, remember, you're curling it up and then as you're, sta uh, you're straightening your toes back out and trying to point upwards, that's extension. Uh, plantar flexion of your foot is where you're stomping on the gas when you're driving the car. And dorsiflexion is where you're taking your foot back up off the, the gas. And then inversion and eversion, again, inversion is where you're taking your toes and you're trying to point it towards the your other foot. You're pointing it medially, your toe medially. Then eversion is where you're taking your, your foot and you're trying to point it the opposite way. You're trying to turn it uh, laterally. Muscles in the anterior extensor compartment of the leg are primarily toe extensors and ankle dorsiflexors. Although dorsiflexion is not a powerful movement, it's important in preventing the toes from dragging during walking. The primary toe extensors and ankle dorsiflexors are the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, fibularis tertius, and the extensor hallucis longus. So here's an animation that goes over the muscles that act on the ankle and foot. So this is an overview video, so be sure you look at this one. This video goes over movements of the ankle and foot. This is part A. And there's another one that, uh, I think there's another one, or it might be the same one, that, uh, that goes over the muscles, the anterior muscles that act on the ankle and foot. So be sure you look at these videos. We're going to start out by looking at the muscles of the anterior compartment. Now, these muscles are dorsiflexors of the ankle, and they have a common intervention, which is the deep fibular nerve. Paralysis of the anterior muscle group causes foot drop. This requires your leg to be lifted unusually high during walking, so you don't end up tipping over your toes. Now, one of the causes for shin splints, which is also called anterior compartment syndrome, is when these muscles of this anterior compartment get inflamed. The first muscle we're going to be looking at is this tibialis anterior. And this is a superficial muscle of the anterior leg. And as you can see, it's found on the lateral aspect of the tibia, and it runs laterally to it. Origin is a lateral condyle in the upper two-thirds of the tibial shaft and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is by a tendon into the inferior surface of the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal bone. As for its action, this is a prime mover of dorsiflexion. It inverts the foot and it also assists in supporting the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. And it's innervated by the deep fibular nerve. Next, we look at the extensor digitorum longus. This is a unipate muscle on the anterolateral surface of the leg. It runs lateral to the tibialis anterior muscle. Its origins are the lateral condyle of the tibia, the proximal three-fourths of the fibula, and the interosseous membrane. For this insertion, it's the middle and distal phalanges of toes 2, 3, 4, and 5 via the extensor expansion. As for its action, it's a prime mover of toe extension, and this, it acts mainly at the metatarsophalangeal phalangeal joint. It also dorsiflexes the foot. For its nervous supply, it's innervated by the deep fibular nerve. The fibularis tertius, which is a small muscle over here, is usually continuous and fused with the distal part of the extensor digitorum longus. It's not always present in everyone. Its origin is the distal anterior surface of the fibula and the interosseous membrane. And its insertion is by a tendon on the dorsum of the fifth metatarsal. Its prime action is to dorsiflex and evert the foot. And it's also innervated by the deep fibular nerve. The extensor hallucis longus is found deep to the extensor digitorum longus and the tibialis anterior. Its origin is the anteromedial fibula shaft and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is by a tendon on the distal phalanx of the great toe. And it's also innervated by the deep fibular nerve. And in this picture, you can see the tibialis anterior. And we see the origin over here, which is on the lateral condyle and the upper two-thirds of this tibial shaft. Then as we go down, you can see the insertion into the inferior surface of the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal bone over here. 
So in this picture, we see the fibula is tertius, and we can see the origin, which is on the distal anterior surface of the fibula, and we can see the insertion, which runs down to the tendon, and it inserts on the dorsum of the fifth metatarsal. And then over here, we have this extensor house as longus, and again, you can see the origin being the, the medial aspect of the fibula, and then also we can see it, uh, the tendon that runs down to insert on the hallux, which is the great toe. We can see the sensor digitorum longus here, and you can see the origin over here for that being the lateral condyle of the tibia and three-fourths of the fibula, in addition to the intraosseous membrane, which you cannot see. You can clearly see the insertions over here, uh, which are on the middle and the distal phalanges of your second, third, fourth, and fifth toes. Be sure you view this video for the tibialis anterior, this one for the extensor digitorum longus, and this one for the extensor hallucis longus. Again, you can find these videos on YouTube or you can go to the Pearson website. In addition to that, uh, if your book came with the DVD, be sure to refer to that. Muscles of the lateral compartment of the foot are the fibular muscles that are plantar flex and evert the foot. In addition to that, they also stabilize the lateral ankle and the lateral longitudinal arch of the foot. So the two primary muscles we're going to be looking at are the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. The first muscle we're going to look at is this fibularis longus. This is a superficial lateral muscle. It overlies the fibula. Its origin is the head in the upper portion of the lateral fibula and is insertion by a long tendon that curves under the foot to the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform bone. Its action is to plantar flex and evert the foot. It also may help keep the foot flat on the ground. It's innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. The fibularis brevis, which is smaller and runs deep to the fibularis longus, is enclosed in a common sheath. Its origin is a distal fibula shaft and is insertions by a tendon running behind the lateral malleolus to insert on the proximal end of the fifth metatarsal. Its action is to plantar flex and evert the foot, and it's also innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. And in this picture, you can see the fibularis longus, and you can see the origin up over here, which is the head and the upper portion of the lateral fibula. Then as you go down uh, this uh, tendon, it runs to the underside of the foot, and you can see over here in this close-up that it inserts into the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform bone. Here we can see the fibularis brevis, and you can see the origin on the distal fibula shaft, and then we can uh, go down and see the insertion on the proximal end of the fifth metatarsal. Here we have another animation for the fibularis longus, so please be sure to view this on the Pearson website, on YouTube, or the DVD that may have come with your book. Muscles of the posterior flexor compartment primarily plantar flex the foot and flex the toes. Plantar flexion is the most powerful movement of the ankle because it lifts the entire weight of our body. It's essential for standing on tiptoes and provides a forward thrust when walking and running. They're all innervated by the tibial nerve and they're divided into superficial and deep muscles. We'll start off with the superficial muscles. The triceps serrae, which refers to the muscle pair of the gastrocnemius and the soleus, shapes the posterior calf and inserts via a common tendon into the calcaneus of the heel. This calcaneal or Achilles tendon is the largest tendon in the body, and these muscles are the prime movers of ankle plantar flexion. As you can see, the gastrocnemius is the superficial muscle of the pair. It has two prominent bellies that form the proximal curve of the calf. Its origins by two heads from the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, and its insertions to the posterior calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. Its prime action is to plantar flex the foot when the knees are extended, but because it also crosses the knee joint, it can flex the knees when the foot is dorsiflexed and it's innervated by the tibial nerve. And in this picture, we can see that the gastrocnemius has been cut out, so we can see the soleus muscle, which we're going to be talking about next. But um, here you can see the calcaneal tendon, which attaches onto the calcaneus. So the soleus is this broad, flat muscle that runs deep to the gastrocnemius on the posterior surface of the calf. Its origin includes the superior tibia, fibula, and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is also the posterior aspect of the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. There's an animation for the gastrocnemius, and there's one for the soleus. So be sure you view these two videos. Now we're going to be looking at the deep muscles of the posterior compartment. The first muscle that we're going to be looking at is this popliteus. This is a thin triangular muscle at the posterior knee. It passes inferior medially to the tibial surface. Its origins are the lateral condyle of the femur and the lateral meniscus. And its insertion is the proximal tibia. As for its actions, it flexes and rotates the leg medially to unlock the extended knee when flexion begins. Additionally, with the tibia fixed, it rotates the thigh laterally. It's innervated by the tibial nerve. 
The flexor digitorum longus is a long, narrow muscle. It runs medial to and partially overlies the tibialis posterior. It has extensive origins on the posterior tibia, and as for its insertion, it's by a tendon that runs behind the medial malleolus and inserts into the distal phalanges of toes 2, 3, 4, and 5. As for its actions, it plantar flexes and inverts the foot, and it also flexes the toe. It helps the foot grip the ground. It's also innervated by the tibial nerve. The flexor hallucis longus is a bipendent muscle which lies lateral to the inferior aspect of the tibialis posterior. Its origin is the mid shaft of the fibula and the interosseous membrane. Its insertion is by a tendon that runs under the foot to the distal phalanx of the great toe. Its prime actions are to plantar flex and invert the foot, in addition to flexing the great toe at all the joints. Additionally, this is known as the push off muscle during walking, and it's also innervated by the tibial nerve. The tibialis posterior, this is a thick, flat muscle that's deep to the soleus and is placed between the posterior flexors. Its origin is the superior tibia, the fibula, and the interosseous membrane. As for the insertion, it's by a tendon that passes behind the medial malleolus and under the arch of the foot, and it inserts into several tarsals and metatarsals 2, 3, and 4. As for its action, this is a prime mover of foot inversion. It also plantar flexes the foot and it stabilizes the medial longitudinal arch of the foot as during ice skating, and it's innervated by the tibial nerve. So in this picture, you can see the origin spanning the superior tibia and the fibula, and then as you go down, you can see the insertion uh, going across tarsals and metatarsals 2 through 4. For the flexor digitorum longus, you can see the origins over the uh, tibia over here, and then the insertion goes over to, via the ascendants to the second, third, fourth, and fifth phalanges. For the popliteus, you can see the origin over here on the lateral condyle of the femur, and then it comes over to attach onto the proximal tibia for its insertion. And for the flexor hallucis longus, you can see the origin for it on the mid shaft of the fibula, and the insertion by uh, via a uh, tendon onto the hallux, or the great toe. And we have more videos, uh, animations to watch. This one shows the posterior view of the tibialis posterior. This one goes over the flexor digitorum longus. There's one for the flexor hallucis longus. And this one goes over the superficial muscles that act on the ankle and foot. And this one goes over the deep posterior muscles that act on the ankle and foot. So please be sure you watch all these videos. Again, go to the Pearson website, or you can look for them on uh, YouTube. Uh, or if your book came with the DVD, uh, use that as well. Now we move on to the intrinsic muscles of the foot, which are responsible for toe movement and arch support. The extensor digitorum brevis is the sole muscle on the dorsum of the foot, which helps to extend the toes. The plantar muscles occur in four layers. So we have the superficial, the second layer, the third layer, and the deepest layer. Overall, the foot muscles are remarkably similar to those in the palms of the hand. So we're going to be looking at the muscles on the dorsum of the foot first. And the only muscle that's there, as we know, it's the extensor digitorum brevis. And this is it right over here. This is that muscle. And uh, we cannot see the origin, but the origin would be over here, which is where we'd find the calcaneus bone. But you can see the uh, insertions where they would go on to the second, third, fourth, and fifth on the extensor expansion of these uh, digits. Now we're going to be looking at the first layer of muscles on the sole of the foot, and specifically we're going to be looking at the abductor hallucis, we're going to look at the flexor digitorum brevis, and we're going to be looking at the abductor digiti minimi. And these are the most superficial layer of muscles. So we'll start off by looking at the flexor digitorum brevis. This is a band-like muscle that we find in the middle of the sole. Uh, its origin is the calcaneal tuberosity, and its insertion is in the middle phalanx of toes 2, 3, 4, and 5 and its action is to help flex the toe, and it's innervated by the medial plantar nerve. The next one we'll look at is this muscle here, the abductor digiti minimi, and this is the most lateral of the three superficial sole muscles. Uh, its origin is the calcaneal tuberosity, and its insertion is the lateral side of the base of the little toe's proximal phalanx. Its job, its prime action, is to abduct and flex the little toe, and it's innervated by the lateral plantar nerve. Next, we'll look at the abductor hallucis. Some people, sometimes you also call it abductor hallucis. Uh, so uh, I've seen both terms used, so you can call it whatever you want, either one. You can say hallucis or hallucis. Uh, so this muscle, uh, it lies medial to the flexor digitorum brevis, and its origin is the calcaneal tuberosity and the flexor retinaculum. For its insertion, it joins with the medial tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis into the plantar half of the medial side of the base of the proximal phalanx of the great toe. 
For the second layer of muscles, we have the flexor accessorius, which is also known as the quadratus plantae, and the lumbricals. So first, let's take a look at this one, the flexor accessorius. Uh, this is a rectangular muscle that's just deep to the flexor digitorum brevis in the posterior half of the sole. Its origin is the medial and lateral sides of the calcaneus. Its insertion is by tendon of the flexor digitorum longus in the midsole. For its action, it straightens out the oblique pull of the flexor digitorum longus and it's innervated by the lateral plantar nerve. And here you can see these flexor accessorius. Now we move on to the lumbricals. And these are these four little worm-like muscles, which are similar to what we saw in the hand. Its origin is from each tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, and its insertion is by the extensor expansion on the medial aspect of proximal phalanx of toes 2, 3, 4, and 5. By pulling on the extensor expansion, its prime action is to flex the toes at the metatarsophalangeal joints and extend the toes at the intraphalangeal joints. And for its nervous supply, it's innervated by the medial plantar nerve for the first lumbar call and the lateral plantar nerve for the second to fourth lumbar call. The third layer of muscles include the adductor hallucis, the flexor hallucis brevis, and the flexor digiti minimi brevis. The flexor hallucis brevis covers the first metatarsal and is split into two bellies. Its origin is the lateral cuneiform and the cuboid bones, and its insertion is via two tendons onto the base of the proximal phalanx of the great toe. As far as far as actions go, it flexes the great toe at the metatarsophalangeal joint, and is innervated by the medial plantar nerve. Next, we look at the adductor hallucis, which run deep to the lumbricals and have oblique and transverse heads. The origin for the oblique head is from the bases of metatarsals 2, 3, and 4, and from the fibularis longus tendon sheath. For the transverse head, it's from a ligament across the metatarsophalangeal joints. As for the insertion, it's on the lateral aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx of the great toe. Its prime action is to help maintain the transverse arch of the foot. It's also a weak adductor of the great toe. Its nervous supply is by the lateral plantar nerve. The flexor digiti minimi brevis covers metatarsal 5. Its origin is the base of metatarsal 5 and the tendon sheet of the fibularis longus. Its insertion is the base of the proximal phalanx of toe 5. As for its action, it flexes the little toe at the metatarsophalangeal joint and is innervated by the lateral plantar nerve. Next, we have the plantar and the dorsal interossei. These are similar to the palmar and the dorsal interossei of the hand in location, attachments, and actions. However, the long axis of the foot around which these muscles orient is the second digit, not the third as we see in the hand. For the origin, there are three plantar interossei arising from the base and medial plantar surface of the third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal bones. For the insertion, it's the medial side of the base of the first phalanx of the same toe and into the tendon of the extensor digitorum longus. First action is to flex the proximal and extend the distal phalanges and adduct the toes towards the axis of the second toe. Its nervous supply is by the lateral plantar nerve. So in this illustration, the main message that they're trying to get across is that the anterior compartment muscles of your thigh, uh, they extend the leg. The medial compartment of the thigh, these muscles, they adduct the thighs. Uh, the muscles that make up the posterior compartment of the thigh, they flex the leg and they extend the thigh. The next slide, again, they're showing you the lateral compartment uh, muscles of the leg, uh, which plantar flex and evert the foot. And then when you look at the, the posterior compartment of the, the leg, these muscles, they plantar flex the foot and they flex the toes. When you look at the anterior compartment of the leg, uh, these muscles, they dorsiflex the foot and they extend the toes. Uh, and then there's an animation here. Uh, that go over the actions of the muscles of the anterior compartment of the leg. Here's another video that goes over the actions of the muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg. Here's one more for actions of the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. And this is the last slide. So be sure you view these animations. Uh, go to the Pearson website, use a, d a DVD that may have come with your book, or you can search for them on YouTube. If you haven't seen the other parts of Chapter 10, please be sure to view those lectures as well. You can find the, the link for it in the description below. Also, they're in the playlist. Um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. S please be sure to subscribe to this. Uh, and also, please share with your friends, uh, your classmates, your coworkers, uh, your teachers, anybody you think that may, uh, you know, you, that you think may find them helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me a message through YouTube. Leave it in the comments below. But I prefer that you send, uh, send me your questions directly on uh, to my Gmail address. 
that you can find in the description below as well. Also, please subscribe to my Facebook page. Um, again, when I post some uh, new lectures, uh, there's notifications on Facebook. And also, if I'm doing something else, I'll, you know, you guys will be the first to know, uh, you know, as to new materials that may be produced and posted. Uh, thank you so much for watching, guys, and best of luck on your exams.